Jamie, you've been very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, he has been. I can go home now? I have no further questions, Your Honor. Brian? No questions at this time, Your Honor. One moment, Your Honor. If Jamie put the keys in my drawer, aren't you going to ask him about that? I can't. The prosecution hasn't introduced any testimony about the keys, and the keys are part of their evidence. What? That statement that I found in Rick's that places Alicia in Logan's room at the time of the murder. We can't use that either. Not until we find that pilot of yours. It's going to be too late. Mike is almost at the last of his witnesses. Preacher will have to come through and find Rick Mead. Preacher! Preacher! Jody, what's wrong? I was talking to him and, and then I heard this thud like he was falling, like someone hit him. Preacher! They hung up. Okay. Come on. Where are you going? We have to do something. Yes, we are. We are going to tell Derek. What if Rick isn't found? We plan the defense without him. We'll continue it without him. Murdoch, do I have to remind you I don't like private conversations? No, sir. I'm very sorry. I repeat, do you have any questions for the boy? Not at this time, Your Honor. Mr. Carr has no objection. Mrs. Whitney, you may make arrangements to take your boy home. Your Honor. Yes? The sole reason that Jamie was taken from his home was that the court feared that his testimony might be influenced by his mother. Is that correct? Well, I would like to request that he remain in the custody of the court for just a little while longer. What? What? Your Honor, this is preposterous. Murdoch, it was agreed that both you and Mr. Carr would question the boy now, as you requested, so that he could be returned to his mother as soon as possible. Yes, I understand that. Well, this is your client? Mrs. Whitney, you do want your son back, don't you? I mean, that was what you were shouting about before, wasn't it? Of course I want my son back. Now, this should just take a few extra hours. Mike, uh, what time are you intending to call Detective Egan to the stand? She'll be my next witness. And then Geraldine Saxon? Yes. Your Honor, I'd like to request uh, that I might postpone my cross-examination of Jamie Swift until the court has heard those two witnesses. On what grounds? Neither Detective Egan nor Mrs. Saxon will be called to testify in anything concerning Jamie. Well, there's absolutely no way that the prosecution could know that. Now, I risk something by saying this. We are supposed to be on opposing sides, but a woman's freedom is at stake. I will say, Mike, that my line of questioning to Jamie should be a direct result of your witness's testimony. Any objections, Mr. Carr? No, Your Honor, uh, but I... No, I suppose not. Mr. Murdoch, I'm very pleased with the new attitude that you've taken. Just make sure you continue to please me. I'll leave the boy in Mrs. Charles' custody until you're ready for it. Permission granted. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Derek, you have to find him. Certainly help if you could tell me where he was calling from. If I knew that, I wouldn't have come to you. Um, she's upset. I don't see why she should be. Certainly not the first time Preacher's pulled a vanishing act like this. Now look, technically, I can't do a thing until he's been missing for 24 hours. I'm sorry, okay? It's all right. Just tell me exactly what happened from the beginning. All I know is that he's looking for a man by the name of Rick Mead from Mr. Whitney. Why is he trying to help Whitney? He quit his job at WEON. Now he's working full-time for Mr. Whitney. Not the safest career move. Derek, I just know something bad has happened to him. Why do you know that? Because when he called, he was whispering like he was afraid someone might hear him. He asked me to call the police. What did he want you to tell me? That's just it. When he started to tell me, well, that's when I heard that thud. Derek, she is telling the truth. Like, I wonder if this has got something to do with it. This is a report I got from Mr. Ledgard. Uh, who's he? He's the manager of the first bank of Monticello. It seems Whitney was there this morning when, when somebody impersonated Rick Mead and gained access to his safety deposit box. Hmm? Did they catch whoever it was? No, they didn't, but they gave me a very good description. A young man in his mid-twenties, about six foot one, blonde hair, blue eyes. That doesn't sound like anybody you know. Look, it could be anyone. Yeah, but it wasn't. Obviously, that night you two spent in jail didn't do any Derek, good. Derek, please, can't you just find him? Beth, you make sure she stays put. I'm going to do what I can, yes. Do you understand that Mrs. Whitney outburst earlier, her demanding that her son be returned to her by the court, had no part in this trial and therefore should be ignored? I do. 
But you did hear it. Yes, I did. Your opinion? I do feel sorry for Mrs. Whitney. Will that in any way influence your decision regarding her guilt or innocence? You told us to judge her only on the facts. Very good. You may be seated. The jury and the alternates have been polled with no disqualification. Mr. Carr, any comments at this time? No, Your Honor. And I would like to remind opposing counsel the right to call a mistrial based on the incident is reserved by the bench. Let us proceed. Mr. Carr, you may call your next witness. I'd like to call Detective Christine Egan to the stand, please. Detective Christine Egan to the stand, please. Are you going to believe your conversion? Well, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. Let me see it. Detective Egan, did you uh, visit the Whitney home on the night Logan Swift was murdered? Yes, I did. At what time? Uh, give or take five minutes, about 1 o'clock a.m. 1 in the morning. And uh, what did you find at the Whitney home at that late hour? Uh, well, I saw Mrs. Whitney and her manservant, Gunther Wagner. They were both dressed in street clothes, looking as if they'd just come in. At one of Your Honor, objection. I think that Detective Egan is making an assumption. It is. Objection sustained. The witness is instructed to limit her answers to factual recollection of the events, not conjecture. The jury seems to be swinging toward your way. Well, they believe that I've become convinced of your innocence. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I didn't do it to help you. I did it because I wanted my son back, and I still do. Nevertheless, it was a perfect chance for me. Oh, you'd do anything and use anyone to win this case, wouldn't you? I should think you'd be happy about that. I just hope it doesn't backfire. When did your next visit the Whitney house? Uh, while the Whitneys were in Mexico. Did you have a search warrant? Yes, I did. And what did you find? Well, in the master bedroom, in the dresser drawer, I found uh, several loose house keys. People's exhibits are and this. Are these the keys? Uh, yes. Those tiny scratches are my identification marks. Did you make any attempt to find out what locks they fit? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, this one fit the door to Geraldine Saxon's suite at the Monticello Arms. And this one fit the door to, um, to Logan Swift's suite. Mrs. Whitney's fingerprints found on those keys? None were. I mean, none that were identifiable. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Now, in your testimony to Mike Carr, you said that you found those keys in Mrs. Whitney's dresser drawer, the one that's in her bedroom. Is that correct? Yes. But isn't it also true that Mr. Whitney also sleeps in that bedroom? Um, from the looks of Mrs. Whitney, he must sometimes. Okay, Detective Egan. Uh, there was a police report you filed in which you said that you did find some of Mr. Whitney's belongings in that dresser. Is that correct? That's correct. What about the specific drawer in which the keys were kept? Is Murdoch trying to make Whitney look guilty? No, but I wish I knew what he is doing. In that drawer were little odds and ends, uh, his and hers. A couple of old wallets, uh, several watches, tie clips, makeup, so on. So then characterizing the drawer as Mrs. Whitney's is not exactly accurate, is that true? Mrs. Whitney did use that drawer. Some of the things in it were hers. Okay, Detective Egan, you win. No further questions, Your Honor. That's it? That's it. You may step down. This is Geraldine Saxon. Chief, another admirer of your smile wants to question Scott Whitney. Yeah? Well, 
What's up? Well, it seems that um, Preacher was trying to locate Rick Mead for Whitney, and now Preacher's disappeared right in the middle of a conversation with Jody. So, uh, Chief wants Whitney. Better get inside. Are you willing to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. You see it? Mrs. Saxon, the court has already established that Beatles Exhibit R are found in a dresser drawer belonging to what? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Whitney is a key that fits the front door of your hotel suite. Would you have any idea how the Whitneys might have come into possession of it? Yes, of course. It's Raymond's. I gave it to her several years ago when she moved in. Would you tell the court why she moved in with you? Your Honor, objection. That's irrelevant. I'd like to show that in essence, Your Honor. Objection overruled. Raymond came to live with me because she needed a place to stay. She'd been going through some difficult times. And in that time, in addition to providing uh, room and board, did you also provide some personal guidance for her, uh, perhaps filled in as a mother figure? To some extent, yes. When Raven Swift married Sky Whitney, did she return the key to you? No. Did she have occasion to use that key uh, since the time she married Mr. Whitney? Well, during a period of uh, financial difficulty, Skyler and Raven moved into my hotel suite. And it's quite possible that they even had the key duplicated at that time. And when the Whitney's returned to their uh, present address, uh, did they return the key or keys? No, they did not. Had Mrs. Whitney had occasion to use the key since she and her husband returned to their present address? Well, sometimes when Raven was shopping in the area, she she would drop packages off at my hotel suite rather than carrying them around with her. So, can we say that Mrs. Whitney had easy and continued access to your suite at the Monticello Arms Hotel? I suppose so. I show you now, John. Tag People's Exhibit B. Would you identify it for the court, please? Yes, it's my gun. How did you come to be in possession of this gun? It belonged to my late husband, Anthony Saxon. It's registered in my name now. Mrs. Saxon, did Mrs. Whitney know where you kept this gun? I'm not sure. Oh? Had she ever borrowed? Mrs. Saxon. Yes. It was the gun she took to the Monticello Men's Club. Where she threatened several people with it. That gun was unloaded. There were no charges filed. Were you aware at that time that she had borrowed the gun? No, of course not. And when did you know that it, the gun was missing? I, I, <clears throat> I, I don't recall. So? Not only did Mrs. Whitney have easy and continued access to your apartment, but she also had easy and continued access to this gun. Is that correct? Your Honor, objection. Mr. Carr is trying to force the witness to draw a conclusion. I'm asking for an opinion the witness is qualified to give. Overruled. Mrs. Saxon, you must answer the question. Yes. Yes. What? You could say Raven had easy and continued access to the gun. The incident at the Monticello Club. Was this gun clean? Yes, it was. And that's why the jury won't believe that the thumbprint was left there from that particular incident. Could you tell us, when was the last time this gun was cleaned? No, I really can't say for certain. But you're sure that the gun was cleaned after Mrs. Whitney took it to the Monticello Club? I have already answered that, yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Beth, I'm sorry our talk got interrupted. Oh, please, I think this is a bit more important. <laughs> All we can do is sit here and wait anyways. Um, where were we? I'm not sure I had that much more to say. All right, we'll just drop it then. I did want to thank you, though, for confiding in me. It made me feel like an adult for a change. Jody, you're a good friend. Thank you. 
You know, I meant what I said. Being a virgin is nothing to be ashamed of, Beth. I'm not ashamed. That isn't it. Oh, I thought we were going to drop this. I do think it's neat, though, I mean, so romantic. How can you say that? You're 14 years younger than I am, and you're a preacher. Yeah, and aren't we cool, huh? Now, what did you mean by that? Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about before preacher called. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time, it seemed right for both of us. It's just now, I don't know, I'm afraid that I might have rushed into things. Why do you say that? Am I interrupting something? No. There's a little girl talk, huh? Yeah, just girl talk. So what did you find out about Preacher? Did you find it? Give me a break. This is not small town USA. I'm working on it. Oh, I just wish we had a little more to go on. Look, I put an APB out on Preacher, and I am about to interrogate Whitney. So please, if you two don't mind, would you uh, wait outside? Thank you. I'm going to find him, Jody. Don't worry. Wait outside. You want to tell me why I was dragged over here? I should be at the courtroom giving my wife support. I don't have time for your stupid questions. And I suppose getting preacher to defraud the first bank of Monticello is a way of giving support to Raymond. Hmm? Defense care to cross-examine the witness? Yes, I would, Your Honor. Mrs. Saxon. Were the materials that you bought to clean the gun, the rags, the cleansing solution, etc., intended for use only on the gun and not, say, to polish the silverware? Polish the silver? No, no, of course not. Those things are sold as a gun cleaning kit. Am I to take that to mean that you were in the habit of cleaning the gun yourself rather than having it professionally cleaned? Well, it's not that difficult. Well, the reason I bring up the silverware is just that, uh, well, I'm curious as to why you would clean a gun. I mean, it wasn't on display on the mantelpiece or anything like that, was it? No, no. You see, I'm not very fond of guns, but I am aware of the need to keep a gun in good working order. I see. Are you an expert in firearms? No. Are you an expert in cleaning firearms? Hardly, no. Then is it possible that the last time you cleaned the gun, you might have missed a spot, say the solitary thumbprint of Raven Witness? Why, yes, I, I, I could have. Objection, Your Honor. There's no way in the world the witness can be certain that she missed the thumbprint. Sustained. Well, actually, the district attorney is quite right. It's very difficult to see a thumbprint with the naked eye. It would be difficult to be certain that you did miss the thumbprint, but isn't it possible that you might have missed the thumbprint. Oh, yes. Yes, I could have. Thank you. No further questions, Your Honor. You weren't at the bank this morning? No, well, I was at the bank this morning. That's right. It, it's one of the joys of having money. Yes. Well, look. When you rent a safety deposit box, you've got to fill out one of these. It's a signature card. So the bank can verify your signature and nobody else can gain access to your box. Yes, I know. Would you get to the point? The point is, it's, the date on this card does not coincide with the date that Rick Mead rented his box. And supposedly, they were filled on the same day. So? This doesn't even match Rick Mead's signature on his checking account. Rick Mead never signed this card. Come on, what are you accusing me of forging his signature? I'm saying you were involved. This phony card was substituted for the real one at a time when you were causing a diversion at the bank. Oh, that's a lot of nonsense. There was some sort of ruckus going on at the bank when I was there, and it involved the bank manager and some other man, but I don't know who else that was. I've got good reason to believe that was Preacher Emerson impersonating Rick. Well, the bank manager would certainly be able to pull him out of the lineup once we found him. Well, why would Preacher do something like that? Well, why don't you tell us? He does work for you. Well, he's an electronics consultant. Yeah. <laughs> electronics. You hired him to find Rick Mead, and now he's missing under what might be considered sinister circumstances. Well, I want to find him. What happened to him? Look, what did you and Preacher take out of Rick Mead's box this morning? And where did Preacher think he'd find Rick Mead? <clears throat> Look, I'll remind you I'm speaking to you without benefit of counsel. And wh why should I answer your questions anyway? Preacher called Jody this morning, said he had something very important to tell her and that she should call me. And if Preacher left that kind of a message, it must have been pretty desperate. Well, what was it that was so important? He never had a chance to finish it. And he hasn't been heard of since. 
I want you to level with me, or you're going to be giving your wife support from an adjacent cell. Yes. Yes, he is here. All right. We're about to be called as a witness for the prosecution, so speak fast. 